This video is brought to you by NVIDIA Remix, powering extraordinary glow-ups for games like the recently remixed Portal RTX. It's an overhaul so impressive that Digital Foundry called it an absolute triumph, and it's just the first of many remixes on the way thanks to NVIDIA's industry-leading technology. Click the link below to check it out for yourself, or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Right, so I've done a few Game of the Year lists in the past, just straight up and down forced rank lists of the best stuff I've played in a given year. Wasn't really feeling that this year, to be honest. Nothing wrong with it, but the truth is, some of the best gaming stuff I've experienced this year wouldn't fit into that video format, because they weren't actually video games. See, the thing is, as I mentioned in my 2022 year in review video, video games are probably the most influential cultural force on the planet right now. Their influence spills over into every other medium. Movies, television, books, magazines, music, podcasts, fashion, theme park rides, you name it. So increasingly, when I think about video games, I don't just think about games. I think about gaming culture. And when I do lists like this in the future, they're not only gonna contain the best video games I've played. They're gonna be the best gaming things that I've come into contact with. Don't worry, plenty of games on this list as well, but plenty of other stuff too. And hopefully it's stuff that you yourself haven't discovered. So maybe you find something new here, that'd be nice. So why don't we start with something fun, something unexpected. We begin with the Callisto Protocol. Helix Station. Run, run! Imagine if just one of those things gets off Helix. Goodbye, Ganymede Beaches. Goodbye, IO and Europa. Yesterday, this was a human being, like both of us. But now? Wait a minute. What the hell? What's up? Something's tapping on the air vent. So the Callisto Protocol, uh, not great. Didn't hate it, but certainly don't have many kind things to say about it. Like everyone else, I was really excited for it. And in the lead up, I got wind of something that almost no one else seemed to have noticed. The developer was releasing a prequel to the game in the form of a dramatized podcast called the Callisto Protocol Helix Station. To my surprise, I would learn it was fronted by none other than Gwendolyn Christie, AKA Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones, as well as Michael Ironside, AKA Sam Fisher from Splinter Cell Games. This is a six part series that released almost weekly before the release of the game. And it tells the story of Helix Station, once the affectionately nicknamed Diamond in the Dark when it was a thriving colony, now an all but abandoned relic after a horrific event rendered it uninhabitable. Let me tell you right now, this is good shit. I was so in on this that I was refreshing Spotify repeatedly on the days I expected new episodes to drop. The writing is pretty solid. The voice talent is absolutely flawless. And the 3D audio that the podcast is mixed with is fucking scary. I'd be out for a run and I'd have to like stop and turn around because I thought I'd heard something behind me. I'm not including this podcast as a dig at the game because I've already said my piece on that, but the game becomes all the more disappointing when you listen to just how good this podcast is. This also has celebrity talent, but it uses it properly. They are actual characters with lines and emotion. This has a plot that is actually interesting. This is actually scary. There is a grasp of horror here that the game never comes close to. Much like Jaws, the monster you can't see is the scariest and you can't see anything in a podcast. So your imagination is doing so much heavy lifting and going to places so much wilder and scarier than the boring ass game ever does. You guys were all excited for Callisto Protocol before it dropped. Having listened to this podcast, I was more excited than everybody else because I was like, damn man, if this is the quality of storytelling, performances and horror we can expect from just the spin-off podcast, then holy shit, we are in for a good time when the game drops. Sadly, none of that came to pass, and with how little impact Callisto Protocol made, I expect this podcast will be a forgotten footnote, if it's lucky. I mean, this shout out is probably the most promotion this podcast has ever received. It's a shame, because it deserves better. It is a good production, made by talented people, and if you have two and a half hours free, I strongly recommend it. Speaking of stuff that no one really talks about or has heard of... My 2022 began here with Nobody Saves the World from Drinkbox Studios. This was only on my radar because this is the team that made Guacamelee, and that is, hands down, one of the best Metroidvanias and platformers ever in my book. So when I heard they were doing this, I didn't even really research what it was. I just downloaded it on Game Pass and started playing it. What a game. Ah, uh, man. Imagine the perspective, map, exploration, and progression of Zelda crossed with a class-based gameplay model allowing you to switch whenever you like between up to 17 different classes and then cross that with the combat loop of an ARPG like Diablo, complete with high-difficulty dungeons remixed with modifiers. Oh, and you can play the entire thing through co-op. 
Every single square inch of this game is brimming, absolutely brimming with originality, innovation, personality, and polish. It is such a dense game. No matter which part of it you look at, it's all watertight. Every class, every section of the map, every dungeon, the art design, the humor, the soundtrack, the, the soundtrack is actually a, a real standout. The whole thing feels so effortless and clicks together so seamlessly. And there are very few games I've played this year that came together as well as this one did. It was the first indie title released in 2022, and it really presaged just how good a year indies were about to have. It's really cheap to buy and it's on Game Pass. Like I said in my review in January, please don't skip this. Sticking with the whole, you've never heard of this thing, meet Domekeeper. that I've had installed on my Steam Deck since the moment I played the demo during a Steam Next Fest. It released in September and it's been a regular in my evening rotation. Hopping into bed at night, booting up the Steam Deck, digging around in Dome Keeper for a bit to see how far I can get before either dying or sleeping. I'll let you figure out which one of those is in-game or IRL. Best way to describe Dome Keeper is imagine the procedural spelunking and voxel-based destruction of Deep Rock Galactic, except it's solo, and every few minutes you need to come back up to the surface to fight off waves of enemies who are trying to burst your bubble, literally. Central to it is a tension that elevates every tiny decision you make. Do you stay a second or two longer down below to collect a little bit more ore, knowing that it may be used to purchase vital defensive upgrades up top, or do you abandon your dig empty-handed, giving you the speed to race back up to the surface faster, but you're up for a tougher fight when you get there? Do you spend your ore on a stronger laser, or one that moves more quickly, or one that stuns enemies? Do you build a teleporter for quick access to the depths, or a conveyor belt to ferry stuff to the surface for you? Every run is totally unique. The location of the ore and artifacts beneath you, the combination of enemies that spawn in, the random power-up options you'll discover. I just keep coming back to this because I know that every time I do, I'm going to be pushed into the same tense, immersive decision-making loop. It's a wonderfully designed little game that feels a little unfinished, if I'm honest. You can tell there's a lot more potential to this idea than has been realized in this initial release, but more content is being added, and I suspect I'll continue to come back to this one for a long time yet. Don't Keeper got a nomination in Steam's most innovative gameplay category, and it totally deserves it. It's about 10 bucks, and there's no way you'll regret it. Look, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm nervous about putting Marvel Snap on this list. I mean, on the one hand, I love it. I think it's fantastic. I never thought I'd be all in on a card game ever again, having been through a few of them in the pre-Hearthstone era, and then going large on Hearthstone back in its heyday before the game collapsed under the weight of its own business model. But here I am. I'm back playing a card game each and every day and have been for weeks. I am late to the party compared to many others, but now that I'm here, I'm nodding my head saying, yep, I can see why you are all so into this. My reluctance to include it in this video comes from the question marks that sadly loom so large over every mobile game. I've reached a point now where after having bought a $20 season pass, I'm pretty starved for resources and my ability to unlock new cards has slowed to an absolute crawl. I'd happily spend some money to be able to continue my progress, but the game is really only offering me bundles for like $30, apparently there's one for like $100, I'm not spending that. Still, Marvel Snap makes the list because on the whole, its approach to monetization is better than any other card game I've ever played. Abandoning wholesale the card pack dice roll that was the bedrock of the trading card industry since its inception. I can't say whether I like Marvel Snap's monetization, but I know I don't hate it, and that already puts it well ahead of the competition. All the money stuff aside though, this is just a great game. Its randomized map zones provide an almost roguelike quality to it. No two rounds ever feel the same as the combination of your deck, the enemy's deck, and the zone modifiers produces some truly wild, totally unpredictable outcomes, regularly. Hearthstone got boring because every game ended up playing out the exact same way. I had to recently quit Clash Royale for the same reason. Marvel Snap is now my go-to, and if the developers choose to make an honest dime out of this and not take the piss, this one will absolutely go the distance. It's on mobile, it's on PC. Check it out, I think you'll like it. I feel like I'm the only person out there with a kind word for Horizon games and seeing how much it's getting bullied, I feel I am duty bound to show it some love in this video. I have earlier likened Horizon Zero Dawn to Avatar and as time goes on that parallel becomes more and more apt. 
See, both of these are about tribal cultures facing off against the threat posed by technology wielded by heartless mega corporations. Both of them were wildly successful in their first outing, but left no notable cultural footprint to speak of. Both of them suffer the slings and arrows of haters, dismissing them as soulless popcorn fodder, prioritizing tropes and spectacle over something deeper and more thought provoking. Both of them are waved away in the same way that Scorsese waves away the Marvel films. This is not cinema, they say. But as Avatar 2 crosses the $1 billion revenue milestone, and as Horizon Forbidden West sits at a mighty 88 on Open Critic, I say with my whole chest, this is cinema. It is the cinema of cutting edge technology. For what game this year produced more visual density per square inch than Horizon? It's the cinema of action. For how many games this year came close to the spectacle that was each and every encounter with these prehistorically inspired robotic foes? This is the cinema of costume design and makeup, for which game this year had a cast of characters and NPCs who were better to just behold as you stood before them, conversing about this or that. It's so interesting to find the line that separates The Last of Us from Days Gone, The Witcher from Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the MCU from Avatar, God of War from Horizon. I know it's more than a little to do with that X factor we might shorthand as heart or soul. And I know that most of the criticisms leveled at Horizon are about how it feels absent these things. I kind of agree. I think it tries to go for them, but it doesn't nail it, which is why Horizon can feel like a really advanced automaton. Technically marvelous, but still synthetic. The point I'm trying to make with this block is, I'm okay with that. I don't need every indie game to be Kentucky Route Zero, nor do I need every AAA left set third person open world 35-ish hour long action adventure RPG hybrid to tickle me in the feels. Sometimes I'm totally fine with an awesome world to explore, some really fucking pretty visuals, some top tier combat and spectacle, and some nice set pieces thrown in for good measure. Avatar did this and it was good, actually. Horizon Forbidden West does it in almost the exact same way and it too is good, actually, and it deserves respect, okay? Stop heading on Horizon, it's a good game. My one suggestion though for the launch of Horizon 3, maybe don't launch it the same week as a genre defining masterpiece. That's not been a good business strategy to this point. I think you should change it up next time around. Just a thought. All right, with that out the way, if it's cinema that you want, how about this? How many games you play this year like Scorn? If you said more than zero, uh, you're lying. Scorn was entirely unique in a way that you're going to find either awesome or aggravating. Its level design didn't make any fucking sense and it was basically purpose built to confuse and disorient you. Its puzzles were so elaborate that they bordered on laborious with solutions oscillating between patronizingly obvious and frustratingly opaque. It was so committed to its one or two visual inspirations that it would feel one note if you, the player, weren't equally invested in those one or two visual inspirations. And the combat was... Yeah, the combat was terrible, there's no other way to slice that. But look, if you found yourself loving what Scorn was doing, then Scorn was probably one of the best things that you played this year as well. The HR Giga and Besinski inspired visual motif was a match made in heaven. The cold, dead chitin and skeletal wireframes of Giga overgrown with pulsating postulous tumors and tangled blood red arteries. Its puzzle box worlds were so inventive, like a giant Rubik's cube where each piece had to be rotated this way or that until they clicked into place. The environmental storytelling on display here made each new area its own silent, unsolvable mystery. What was all of this once for? You'll spend the entire time wondering that, but you'll never get the answer, and it's better that way. Scorn is not high art in the traditional sense, and it's not trying to be, but you can tell it was inspired by that. Art was its cornerstone. It was never trying to be a deeply playable shooter, and when it does gesture towards that, it generally fails. Scorn would have been a better game if you didn't have to kill anything, and you could just wander around looking at cool shit and trying to spot all the penises. Spoiler alert, there's a lot of penises. It's the only game on this list where a considerable chunk of it doesn't actually work, but I think it's a testament to the rest of the package that Scorn survives its awful combat. I can't promise you that you'll love Scorn, but I can promise you that you've never played anything like it, and love or hate it, you are not going to forget it anytime soon. You know what you will love though? This. My friend Jake Baldina has a phrase, video game ass video game. And goddamn, am I glad that phrase now exists because I couldn't think of a better strap line for Rollerdrome. Rollerdrome is the aerial antics and speed of skateboarding crossed with the murderous nihilism of the Thunderdome. It's Tony Hawk meets Doom meets Max Payne meets The Running Man with a little bit of Ace Combat thrown in for good measure. Check the full review for the detail on that one. Rollerdrome and I came together like two drops of water. As soon as I picked it up, I'm like, oh my God, this is 
everything. Its Mobius art style is very much my jam, and its lo-fi sci-fi aesthetic creates some very strong imagery and iconography both in the arena and outside of it. The sprinkles of narrative in between each mission left me thirsty for more, and the smart collection of challenges and difficulties make the game deeply replayable. But in truth, it doesn't need that stuff to be replayable. It already achieves that through its gameplay, which prunes back everything unnecessary in the equation. You can't fall down. Most of your weapons auto-target. The tricks are extremely easy to execute. With all of this deck space cleared, there's so much room to focus on the more fun stuff. Speed and spectacle and carnage. All the more amazing is the fact that this isn't even the only S-tier game that this studio released this year. Roll7 also released Oli Oli World, a game that I didn't play any more than a small amount of, but it's gone on to receive many Game of the Year nods and accolades. An amazing achievement. Roll7 is definitely a studio to watch. All right, time to mix it up a little bit. Let's head back to Night City, shall we? Recently, there was an article in The New Yorker titled, Can The Last of Us Break The Curse Of Bad Video Game Adaptations? It's like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? First of all, we already had good video game adaptations as far back as 1995 with the Mortal Kombat movie, an absolutely perfect film, and I will fight and fatalize anyone who disagrees. We had the Pokemon TV show air in 1997, then we had like two decades of bad stuff, admittedly, with the Resident Evil movies and that Doom movie starring The Rock, but look what we've had lately! Sonic 1 and 2, Castlevania, The Witcher, and of course, Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Edge Runners is an absolutely spectacular show. The visual design, the cast of characters, the soundtrack, the absolute batshit insane, balls-to-wall action sequences balanced out perfectly with deft tenderness and gut-wrenching tragedy. It doesn't matter if you're into anime or not, this is just a fantastic production that is worth experiencing. For me, Edge Runners really mattered because it delivered on a promise that the game failed to live up to. In my review of Cyberpunk, I commented that while certain aspects of the story delivered the sort of emotional resonance we hoped for, the exploration of the Cyberpunk theme felt undercooked. The transformative impact of technology on politics, societal structures, consumerism, intellectualism, and so many other aspects of life was underexplored. Cyberpunk 2077 could have been a lot deeper darker, thought-provoking, and confronting than it ended up being. And Edge Runners showed us a vision of what that could look like as it drilled deep into the dangerous and addictive nature of self-augmentation. I think this one little side story immersed me more deeply in the themes of cyberpunk than the game ever did, and I found myself appreciating this setting even more after having watched it. Cyberpunk is not going away anytime soon. There's an expansion coming and a sequel on the way in the years to come. It is a rich universe full of promise. And if you want to see that promise truly delivered without qualification or compromise, then Edge Runners is the place to do it. All right, here comes a weird one. Print media. Now, we all know that game magazines are dead, right? Basically, yes. I mean, there's only a handful of them left these days and you really have to look for them or be subscribed to them so they get delivered to you. But who the fuck subscribes to a magazine in 2022? Me, that's who. I'm subscribed to Edge Magazine and I have been for years and its arrival at my door every month is like the best thing ever because it allows me to connect with this medium, this industry and this hobby in a way that no other platform allows for in 2022. Let me explain. Every day we are bombarded by news and opinion from massive conglomerates to independent commentators to random Twitter eggs with eight digits in their handles. We are being pumped all this information, so much of it unasked for, and the guiding principle for whether or not something will reach you or not is generally speaking, will this make you angry? Not always mind you, but most of the time, anger, or something similar to it, is what algorithms generally focus on. Where this doesn't apply is to creators and individuals you specifically follow on various social media platforms. And in that instance, you've probably made a choice to follow that person because it's likely they hold a similar worldview to you, similar perspectives to the things you're both interested in, similar likes and dislikes, etc. Furthermore, the people you follow, they're probably doing the same thing over and over again, like I am, because the algorithm punishes people for going off script or trying to experiment with their content offering. So I know I'm speaking in massive generalizations here, but as someone who is terminally online, I can absolutely attest to the fact that most of the information that comes to me is a mix of algorithm-driven rage bait and subscription-driven confirmation bias, and it's almost always exactly what I'd expect to receive in both of those categories. 
Enter magazines. Every month I get delivered 100 or so pages on the topic I care about, video games, but I have no idea how that topic will be illuminated for me in that issue. I mean, take just this month's edition of Edge, for example. There's a deep dive into the current state of VR, springboarding off the recent Meta Connect event. There's an article about an exhibition at the British Imperial War Museum focused on virtual warfare. There's a really interesting column from a guy named Adrian Hon who points out quite rightly that game reviewers have to spend so much time keeping up with the gaming zeitgeist that it doesn't leave time to consume other media like books or movies or TV, which weakens their critical faculties. And yes, a thousand times yes, there is a deep dive preview for both Resident Evil 4 and Street Fighter 6. There's a piece on the making of Life is Strange True Colors. There's a profile on Tim Willits, formerly of id Software, but now leading the team making Space Marine 2. And the whole thing finishes with a retrospective of Gran Turismo A-Spec. A lot of the stuff I've just listed, I wouldn't have even known it existed, or I wouldn't have sorted it out, or I wouldn't have paid attention to it had I scrolled past it on Twitter or Reddit. But here, magazine in hand, subscription fee paid, a captive audience am I. I find things I wouldn't have found, and I learn things I wouldn't have otherwise learned. Best of all, neither the composition of the publication nor the individual articles within are intended to make you angry or to elicit any form of capital E engagement. It's just there to inform you, to entertain you, and to expose you to a bunch of different ideas from a bunch of different people. Conventional wisdom says, find a reviewer or whatever whose tastes align with your own. Sure, do that, but also, don't do that. Seek out people who hold different opinions from yourself, who might show you a different perspective. You can find those perspectives in a number of ways, but I promise you that a magazine subscription is actually a really good way to do it. It doesn't have to be edge, it can be anything. I don't think this industry is long for this world, and if we can keep it alive for a few years longer, then I also think that'd be a nice bonus. I'll also mention that there are boutique style publications popping up on Kickstarter, stuff like Lock On from Lost in Cult and A Profound Waste of Time from Caspian Whistler. I recommend checking these out too. I know this was a really weird shout in a Game of the Year video, but I think that the way algorithms and social media platforms feed us info isn't great. And I've come to appreciate my relationship to the printed word more than ever this year. And it just felt right to put that in this video. Look, what can I say about Elden Ring that hasn't already been said by someone else or myself in my 25 minute preview or my 35 minute review or all the times I've talked about it on my news show or my podcast or on Twitter or anywhere else. I've said my piece on this game, but I will say that I do think it was the best game released this year. It wasn't the one I enjoyed the most, but it was the one that I admired the most. Elden Ring was one of the few games that legitimately made me go, how the fuck did human beings make this? And of all the times I've ever said that, this seems like the most how the fuck of all of them. Elden Ring is clearly an incremental work, building on the decades of experience that FromSoft have had making games like this, but it's so much bigger and more ambitious than any of their previous offerings that it has an almost Tolkien-esque quality. You made a game with 72 unique bosses. What the fuck? Every other game would be like, oh, we've got 10 bosses, uh, good job team, uh, 72, what the f what? The map in Elden Ring is a total troll. Oh, you think you've explored a good chunk of it? Eat shit, you've only explored 10% of it, get back to work. I've heard it said that Elden Ring isn't as replayable as games like Dark Souls, Bloodborne, or Sekiro. And it's like, yeah, no shit. This game is literally bigger than all of those games put together. It's also been said that its massive size hurts its pacing, as FromSoft's other games feel tighter, more immediate, and more curated in their moment to moment. All true, but the exploration of the lands between will forever be etched in my memory as one of the greatest gaming experiences I've ever had. We can experience other FromSoft titles again, and I'd argue that we get just as much out of them on the second or fifth playthrough as we did in the first. But you can never truly experience Elden Ring ever again, because so much of that experience is about discovering its locations, enemies, and secrets for the first time, trying to reconcile in your gamer brain how there could be yet more to see in a game that had already, to that point, delivered 10 or 20 or 100 times more amazement than other games. But yeah, Elden Ring wasn't the game I enjoyed the most this year. That was probably this one. Similar to Elden Ring, what else can be said of God of War Ragnarok that hasn't already been said? It's incredible by almost every metric, and I'm honestly really stunned that Sony Santa Monica managed to pull it off. 
I really did go into it thinking that we were in for a good ride, but I thought it would be impossible for them to meet or beat what they did back in 2018. They unquestionably met it, and I think they beat it in almost every category but the surprise factor, since none of us could see 2018 coming. For me personally, God of War has a particular emotional resonance. On the day the reviews for 2018 went live, I was lucky enough to be able to interview Corey Barlog in my car as I drove him to meet his mentor, George Miller, director of the little known Mad Max movies, but best known for his true opus, Babe, Pig in the City. Being there with Corey on that day of all days was special, and to this day, that remains my favorite video. It was a full circle moment then when I got the chance to interview the game director for Ragnarok, Eric Williams at Sony Santa Monica earlier this month. I did it alongside my friends per second podcast buddies, and it was a really inspiring and humbling experience because Eric had led his people to create something truly extraordinary, and it was fascinating to hear him reflect on his own past coming up through the fighting game community and junior game dev arriving at the absolute pinnacle of the industry in this moment. I felt so grateful to have had the chance to speak to him, to have played the game that he and his team made for us, and to be in a job where I get opportunities like that. All right, so we've spoken about the best game that released this year, and we've spoken about the game I enjoyed playing the most this year. Now it's time to talk about the GOAT. You know the one. Whenever I talk about Vampire Survivors, people are like, is this a bit? Is this a meme game? No, no it is not, not in the slightest. Vampire Survivors is a mighty 88 on Open Critic. It is 98% overwhelmingly positive on Steam with over 164,000 reviews in. That makes it the highest rated game on all of Steam for 2022, according to Steam 250's weighted ranking. That puts it above Elden Ring, Stray, God of War 2018, Spider-Man Remastered, Persona 5 Royal, and Sonic Frontiers. Does that mean it's a better game than those others? In the case of Sonic Frontiers, absolutely. But in the case of the other ones, eh, it's a line ball call. Vampire Survivors is what happens when you take the audiovisual feedback of a slot machine and turn it into a video game. And that is not some throwaway descriptor. That is a cold, hard fact, because the guy who made it, Luca Galante, used to be a programmer in the gambling industry. In an interview with The Verge, he said, quote, Slot games are very simple. All the player has to do is press one button, and the game designers have to find a way to push the player to press that button. The player is actually spending money every time they press it, and because of that, there's a huge attention to detail on the sounds, the animations, the sequences, because you have so few elements to work with. And so when making a game, I have automatically applied it to what I've been doing, end quote. The result is a game that has all the hypnotizing, stupefying, brain goopifying appeal of a poker machine without the associated financial ruin. It's all the highs of a jackpot with none of the risks. Well, most of the highs. You don't get paid, but you do get to see a bunch of crazy shit happen on screen, and that's more than enough for me. Outside of the Razzle Dazzle, Vampire Survivors was one of the few truly unique premises we've seen released in a hot minute. There have been similar games that have preceded it, but none that have nailed the formula with such precision. Now, the survivor-like is a thing, with Steam and the App Store flooded with clones trying to recreate the magic, all of them falling short by different degrees. Then there's the approach to unlocks and achievements. I don't give a shit about achievements in any other video game I play, except Destiny, but I care about them here because the achievements provide the metagame structure, forcing me to play with new characters, on new maps, to find new things, to use different combinations of weapons, and to dig deeper into all of the auxiliary systems and game modes that I probably would have otherwise ignored in a game like this. Finally, you can't praise Vampire Survivors without also contextualizing it. This is a game that costs five bucks. Its graphics are so basic. You could have shipped this on the Super Nintendo. It has no microtransactions and its DLC costs $2. It was in early access for a year where it was built out and perfected and it launched flawlessly with no bugs or glitches. It had no marketing behind it whatsoever, being totally reliant on its inherent greatness and word of mouth. In an industry rife with the exact opposite of everything I have just listed, there is something so gratifying about knowing that this little game can rise to the tippity top of the pile and get the commercial and critical reception it deserves. That's right, you thought I left Arcane off the list when I was talking about good video game adaptations, didn't you? Don't worry, I was just saving it for later. Technically, Arcane came out in November of last year, but I only got around to watching it this year, which it turns out was when a bunch of other people were watching it as well, because I swear the first few months of 2022 were dominated by people positively gushing over it. Rightly so, because not only is Arcane one of the best video game adaptations ever, it may be the best one ever. 
Every single frame of it is perfect, from its incredible art design, to the imagination of its sequences and choreography, to the deeply moving plot that pits two ill-fated sisters against each other, champions of two worlds at war. It is a very adult story, unflinching in its portrayal of loss, grief, mental health, societal decay, wealth disparity, the decadence of the rich and powerful, the corruptible nature of law enforcement, and the inherent unfairness of life that is the reality for many people. I'll make the point that you absolutely do not need to have played League of Legends to be able to enjoy this. It introduces each character without any assumed knowledge, and the storytelling absolutely stands on its own with minimal in-jokes or winks to the camera. However, if you do have a background in League, then this is even more incredible. The way that each of these characters have been captured, rejigged, and expanded upon here is incredible. It matters so much because League of Legends characters are brilliantly designed in terms of their visuals, their kits, their personalities, and their backstories. But League of Legends is not a video game where stories can easily be told. To see Riot and the showrunners bring this to life in this way, their imagination runs wild as to where all this could go next, especially as Riot continues to roll out other big ticket offerings like its fighting game and its MMO, both of which are sure to bring new characters and new players to this already thriving universe. Arcane is some of the best television I watched in 2022, and it's based on a video game. Unlike that fucking Halo show, Arcane has deep, deep respect for its source material. It understood that video games are not some awkward teenage phase, and showrunners don't need to shepherd the material into adulthood with some bare-assed glow-up. Video games are already good. You don't need to change the thing that makes them good so they work for TV or film. You instead need to embrace that thing and deliver it in a way that makes sense for TV and movies. Arcane understood the assignment better than any other adaption I have seen, and it was absolutely one of the best video game things I experienced this year. League fan or not, you should check it out. It's on Netflix, it is amazing. Where does Hideo Kojima get his ideas? In this podcast, we take a deep dive into his brain and shed light on his creative process. It is common knowledge that Jeff Keighley is Hideo Kojima's number one simp. That is a lie. It's me, okay? I'm the guy. I'm the dude buying the novel adaptation of Death Stranding. I bought the book he recently wrote about creativity titled The Creative Gene. I'm on his Twitter feed looking at his music shoutouts, thinking to myself, maybe I do need an MP3 player in 2022 for some reason. And while I haven't yet watched Ride with Norman Reedus because it was never aired in my country, I drank enough monster energy to give a humpback whale cardiac arrest and I'm still standing, so take that science. Point is, Hideo Kojima is a game maker and creative I admire greatly. And this year he released a podcast. It's called Brain Structure, and it has been my second favorite gaming thing of the year. It's exclusive to Spotify, it's released weekly in both Japanese and a seamless English translation, so it's very easy to listen to. Each episode goes for around 30 minutes, and the topics are generally centered on whatever the fuck Hideo Kojima wants to talk about. One entire episode, he spoke about Nick Cave's music and what it means to him. The episode is titled Hideo Kojima X Music, Nick Cave, The Velvet Queen. I thought to myself, oh, that's cool. He got Nick Cave on as a guest. Nope, it's literally just Hideo being like, guys, I really love Nick Cave's music. Uh, let me talk to you about it for 35 minutes and I'll uh, play you some songs too. At one point, he even said, Nick Cave, if you're listening, please call me. I'd love to hang out for real. But don't worry, Kojima can pull in some guests. One week, Kojima was talking about how much he enjoyed Jordan Peele's new movie, Nope. And a few weeks later, who was on the podcast? Boom, Jordan Peele talking about Nope. They were just jamming out about how much they were inspired by each other's work. Peele told the story about how he named his production company Monkey Paw, a reference to bad luck and being careful what you wish for. He told Hideo that part of his fascination with luck came from Metal Gear Solid 2, where he saw the plight of the character Fortune, who seemed to be cursed with good luck. I mean, this is one of the best filmmakers working today, chatting with one of the best game makers working today about how much they inspire each other. That is a fucking rad conversation, man. That is just, that is just rad. Kojima interviewed the dude who directed Top Gun Maverick, the dude who directed the original Ghost in the Shell, and the dude who directed R R R or R R R as you Americans say. Anyway, in each conversation, they were talking about what it means to be a creative working at the top of their respective fields. They complain about producers and budgets. They talk about the challenges they face in leading people and they reflect on their own mortality and legacies. But what's most striking about brain structure is that it's a very unfiltered insight into Hideo Kojima, the way he thinks, the stuff he
he consumes, his hopes, his fears, his insecurities, and what you'll find is a very humble man who has not let his fame or success get to him. Usually being a big shot creative begets a big shot ego, but it's not like that. And you can tell in his dialogue with others and with his more introspective monologues that he just loves consuming and creating art. And he'll continue to do that for as long as his mind and body let him. He also has much to teach on the topic of discovery. He talks about how he reads hundreds of books a year, watches hundreds of movies a year, and he still buys CDs because he thinks that going to the music store and just listening to stuff is the best way to find new music. And yeah, that makes so much sense in 2022. There's a gigantic funnel that sits over the top of Kojima, and I think we'd all do well to try to hoist a similar funnel over ourselves. It's similar to what I was talking about earlier with the magazines, which is perhaps why this podcast resonates with me so much. Anyway, Brain Structure is really wonderful. It's a highlight of my week every week, and I'll keep listening to it for as long as Kojima keeps making it, which I hope is for a long time to come yet. Ah, uh, just kidding. I would genuinely love an excuse to award Outer Wilds my game of the year, four years running, but sadly, there's nothing to shout out this year, so we'll just have to settle for this instead. God of War was an awesome video game. Elden Ring will likely influence open world game design for years to come, and Hideo Kojima sure casts a good pod. But there was only one truly industry upending thing that released in 2022, and that thing was Gaben's big deck, the Steam Deck. Valve has had more than a few swings at the hardware market over the years, from its Steam Machine idea, which went absolutely nowhere, to its now discontinued controllers and Steam Link, to its impressive but still niche Index VR headset. But absolutely nothing has come close to the level of success that the Steam Deck has enjoyed, being the first new successfully launched gaming console from a new market entrant since... The original Xbox? Seriously, consoles are a really entrenched business with some massive barriers to entry, and Valve managed to shoulder barge their way in with some absolutely astounding technology for the price point. Because the specs of the Steam Deck machine beggar belief when you view that $399 price tag. This is a very competent gaming PC that is more than able to run actual AAA games at decent frame rates, and it absolutely runs rings around any indie you want to throw at it. The fact that Valve could make this thing is already a low-key miracle, but the fact that they could get it out the door at this price point feels like wizardry. Gabe in the white, that's what they call him. But the true revolutionary thing about the Steam Deck is not its specs or its price point, it's that you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. To this point, the entire console business model has been predicated on the walled garden. The idea that the hardware you purchase is only yours insofar as Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo say it is. They will decide what will and will not be installed on your device. They will decide how you will use your device and there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to go down the confusing jailbreak route, which many consumers just aren't equipped to do. Enter the Steam Deck. You want to install Mac OS on this thing? Go for it. You want to install Windows and run Excel so you can do your monthly accounting? Gay Bank gonna stop you? You want to install every single emulator known to man on this thing? Not only will Valve not stop you, they will advertise that feature in their official marketing. And then they will take it down because they know that Nintendo's lawyers will get them. The Steam Deck shows us a vision of the future-proof video game console. We cannot trust video game companies to preserve video games, and we cannot trust them to give us perpetual access to the things we have purchased. They have shown time and time again that they do not respect the concept of ownership unless it relates to them owning their IP and deciding how they will use it and how they will constantly resell it to us. The PC scene already solved that problem through emulation, and the Steam Deck now solves it for consoles. But beyond the business model stuff, it's just a phenomenal device. There has not been a single day this year where I have not touched my Steam Deck. Even at home, it's part of my evening ritual or a way to change up the scenery when I've been stuck in my office for too long. It's so comfortable to use, so feature rich, so customizable, just such a joy. A Nintendo Switch is effectively retired now, except when playing Nintendo exclusives, because the Steam Deck does everything the Switch does, and I know I will own my games in perpetuity rather than being forced to rebuy them again at $60 when the Deck 2 comes out. The Deck is just brilliant, and so many of the best moments that I've shared with you in this very video, I experienced them on this handheld. For that reason, and many others, Steam Deck is the very best gaming thing that I got my hands on in 2022. Literally. been a long video and I kind of summed up my thoughts on the year that was in my 2022 year in review so I'll just say right here 
Thank you for tuning in. I'm always grateful to be able to do what I do and I couldn't do it without you. If you've ever watched a video, commented, liked, subscribed, shared on Twitter or Reddit, then thank you. A very big thank you to my patrons. You guys are incredibly kind and generous and I always love chatting with you and putting together those Q&A videos. I'm going to take a few weeks off now, but I'll be back at the back end of Jan, getting ready for an absolutely mammoth February and an even bigger 2023. It's going to be a wild ride, so I hope you'll join me. Thank you again, and I'll see you on the flip side. So as we all know, Nvidia released their 40 series GPUs recently, delivering more power than any other GPU on the market and pushing us into a whole new generation of graphical fidelity. The hardware always grabs the headlines because a big shiny new metal slab that makes numbers go up is pretty easy to wrap your head around. But just as important is all the work that Nvidia is doing with its suite of technology tools. Stuff like DLSS 3 that utilizes AI to generate more frames and smoother performance and Nvidia Reflex, which significantly reduces input latency, a big bonus in competitive games like shooters. One of the most fascinating things that Nvidia has been working on lately is Nvidia Remix. Now, as you might have seen in the past, the Nvidia team have worked with different developers to add RTX powered ray tracing to games like Minecraft and Quake. Incredible results that give these games a whole new lease on life. The next project that Nvidia tackled was Portal, and the recently released free update adds full ray tracing to the game in one of the most comprehensive overhauls to a title outside of a full-scale remaster. Portal RTX looks extraordinary, as every reflective surface now reflects light in ways that it never did before, and assets like the portal gun and turrets have been completely replaced with new reflective assets to make the most of ray trace reflections. The lighting here is where things get really crazy though, as the entire lighting model for the game has been rebuilt from the ground up, and it all functions dynamically because of its real-time pathing. This means that portals will now capture light from one location and spill it out to another because light travels through portals just as easily as companion cubes do. What's truly astounding about this though is that the overhaul was done in something called Nvidia Remix, which is a software platform that Nvidia are about to release to the public. This means that developers and modders will be able to use these tools to provide an RTX overhaul to literally thousands of games. Nvidia earlier teased what an overhaul of Morrowind would look like and the results were stunning. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can absolutely expect a huge number of your favorite classic games to get the RTX treatment as Nvidia Remix gets out into the wild and developers and modders start getting to grips with it. Of course, you can't really enjoy ray tracing without the right hardware, and this is where Nvidia's lineup of GPUs enter the picture. Whether it's the latest cutting edge AAA titles supporting ray tracing, or competitive games sporting huge frame rates supported by DLSS, or classic titles visually overhauled thanks to Nvidia Remix, the RTX 40 series GPUs are your ticket to the absolute best in graphical fidelity, functionality, customization, and performance. There is simply no better GPU hardware on the market, full stop. And if you want to get the absolute most out of the games you play, then Nvidia is your one-stop shop. To learn more about Portal RTX, Nvidia Remix, and Nvidia's 40 series GPU lineup, click the link below. Thanks Nvidia for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.